All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Artemis Week here, a special edition for you. I'm Joshua Santora, coming to you immediately with my special guest, Regina Spellman. Regina, thanks for joining me today. Hi, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so we are talking all week about the Artemis program in Greek mythology, the twin sister of Apollo, because we're going back to the moon. Such a cool nod there. Um, and Regina, obviously your title there, Senior Project Manager for 39B. Uh, which is this beauty you see on screen. Let's throw up an image here. Um, and we can talk more about this as we go. Uh, but how'd you get this job? And when did you start um, kind of managing this effort? Yeah, it's, it's, she is beautiful, isn't she? She's uh, right up there with my son. Um, <laughs> I, I tell you, growing up in Indiana, um, and you would tell me that I was going to be working on this project and you know, really looking towards developing a launch pad to support the next generation of, of rockets uh, for NASA's mission, uh, I would would have been a non-believer. Um, but, you know, I started out in engineering. I went to Purdue University and I worked with um, at NASA Langley, actually, which is more of a research center. And I came down to Kennedy Space Center at the beginning of uh, what was Constellation program and started working in systems engineering and moved my way up into project management. Um, had some really good people that I worked with and um, and lo and behold, here I am now as the senior project manager, and I'm responsible for all the development activity out at um, Launch Complex 39B. Yeah, so and when we talk about that, um, also kind of recapping to that image that I showed a minute ago, and this video you see on screen now, um, these lightning towers are 600 feet tall, so this is by no means a small space here. So uh, what's the history of this launch pad? Because it has a very long history. Yeah, you're right. And and the Launch Complex 39B is is about two miles to get all the way around it to give you a little bit of perspective of the scale of that. And like you said, the towers being 600 feet tall, it, it's it's a big place. Um, but it's only a piece of the exploration systems architecture. The first image you had had the mobile launcher. Um, that's what we'll actually stack the vehicle on and, and do the connections. And um, that architecture that we have is similar to what they used in the Apollo program which is when um, this pad was actually built. When they started the Apollo program, they built two pads. Um, so when we refer to LC-39, there's a pad A and a pad B. Um, pad A was built first and, uh, and pad B completed construction in 1967, just behind it, um, right in time to support the, the dry run for Apollo 11. We just had the anniversary for Apollo 11, um, landing on the moon and um, pad B was used as the for Apollo 10, which was a dry run for it in just a few months prior. So, um, you know, Pad B and Pad A both have a, a long history of supporting the Apollo program. Um, and then they were both transitioned to support the, the shuttle program and they were used in tandem. Um, 53 launches actually of the shuttle program um, went off of uh, Pad B. And then towards the end is when the two twin pads started to diverge. Uh, we started to modify Pad B for what was then Constellation, which has become Exploration Ground Systems with SLS and Orion. And then Pad A got transitioned over to SpaceX um, because we're now a multi-user spaceport. And SpaceX has a very different architecture than we do, so they have done different things at Pad A. So the two twin pads no longer look alike. They are, um, have different missions now, um, but we have kind of taken both of those paths to the next generation. Yeah, and, and one of the biggest things there, kind of thinking of that image I just showed of the shuttle program, uh, people who are really have a keen eye, they'll notice that all those structures that were there in place are now gone, and what we call a clean pad design. Can you tell us more about why, and, and when we say clean pad, I think you kind of have some specifics there as far as what that means, um, dirty versus yeah, it, lots of stuff. Yeah, but it's not it's that? not versus dirty. It's uh, clean as in simple and streamlined. That's what we're going for. Um, the architecture of, of, our fly, of our launch vehicles has evolved and our ground systems architecture. Uh, we're more uh, similar to what they use in Apollo where you have a mobile launcher with a tower uh, and you have the vehicle, all the connections to the vehicle are done in the safety of the vehicle assembly building. And that's brought out to the launch pad. And that way you don't have those large structures at the pad. Um, they tried something different in the space shuttle program and had the fixed service structure, the rotating service structure. But we found out over you know 20 some years that even though the ocean is beautiful, it's also the salt air, which is very corrosive, which is a maintenance nightmare. Um, so we had a lot of maintenance that we had to do a lot of cost. So we went back to something similar to the Apollo architecture 
where we bring all of that with us and we keep all of that um, in, inside the vehicle assembly building. And the other added benefit of that is that what you actually see on the pad surface is very neutral. Um, so that also enables other launch companies to come out there and use that same pad and um, they can have their own custom connections to the vehicle on their mobile launcher. So as we think about that clean pad design and going from all those giant structures that were fixed in place to a simple design, what's that process been like? Because obviously, I mean, you, you kind of think of it as being almost just a demolition process. Is it that simple of just, hey, rip it all out and we're done? Uh, I, I want to say I wish, um, but it, <laughs> to get to something simple actually takes a lot of work. So you're right. One of the first things we did have to do was to go in there and demolition it. But when you have you know, two different generations of programs out there, some of that structure and some of those systems are still useful. And we didn't want to start with a, a you know, a blank piece of paper. So, um, you know, the, the pad surface and a lot of those structures that are there, um, the large spheres that you see on the perimeter, the liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen spheres, those are original. And so, you know, we basically kept what was, could be used and did a lot of refurbishment to it or we updated it and where we didn't have something existing already, we actually have gone in and, and put in new systems. So when you're out there at the pad today, you will see all three generations of programs uh, working in concert together to meet our SLS and Orion objectives. Yeah, that's awesome. So can you talk about some of the specifics? What are things, what are the highlights of this process? Um, thinking about the things that are um, new, maybe not necessarily shiny, um, but definitely new and ready for the next generation of rockets. Yeah, we joke that nothing's shiny out the pad. <laughs> it's definitely a working environment. But some of the really visible ones, obviously the demolition of the fixed service structure and rotating service structure, um, and those were sentimental as well. Those were um, visual images of the shuttle program, so it was difficult um, to see that come down. But understanding what the future hold is, you know, really what kind of drove us through that. Um, we also, you know, in gearing up towards, the, you know, SLS is going to be the most powerful rocket ever. So we had to upsize some of it. So um, the flame trench, the flame deflector have been completely redone. Um, the bricks were original Apollo era bricks. We replaced all of those. We put in a new flame deflector that could take the massive thrust from the SLS and um, actually designed it to be able to support any American rocket that's launching today that we knew of. So, um, you know, so we're trying wow. to not only upsize, but we're also trying to keep that multi-user spaceport in mind. Um, we've, we've built three, you mentioned the lightning towers, those, that lightning protection system was one of the first things we did. That is sized to support any rocket that could leave the vehicle assembly building. Um, that's why they're so big. So not knowing what would come, we built as big as we could um, and what we would need to for the vehicle assembly building. But that provides us protection at the pad um, that we've never had before. And the whole idea is trying to enable our launch director to have every opportunity possible uh, to get that vehicle on the, off the ground at the first opportunity. Yeah, we have this video of, of a few of those highlights for you. Um, and just wondering what you can tell us about this. Obviously, 96,000, that's no small number of bricks. Yeah, so yeah, in this video here, you see that well, as a time lapse of them erecting that, um, that flame deflector and the ignition overpressure sound suppression system. We're doing a water flow test of that. And then in the front there, you can see the new bricks. Um, when the mobile launcher was out there, we tested that same system. Um, but really, she's had a complete makeover. There's not a system out there that hasn't been touched, refurbished, or, or replaced. Um, you know, for 50 years old, she's looking fantastic. She's had a complete makeover, has been really upgraded, and um, she's ready to go to get that first launch of Artemis 1 off in 2021. Yeah, awesome. Again, uh, important there to list that date, 2021 for the first flight. And obviously, we, we know that we're declared ready for Artemis 1. Uh, so is your job done? Is it just like we're, we're good here or no. what's what's next? We, we're we always looking for what's next. And and some of these projects, you know, we've been renovating this pad for over 10 years now. Um, and we wow. really had to focus on, on Artemis 1. There are a few projects that were needed for the flight crew um, because we weren't going to need those for the first launch. We've deferred them and we're doing them now. Um, so we're actually... In new construction, I, we, we showed the, the big sphere that's 800,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen. But again, trying to get our launch director every attempt, in order to get her three attempts 24 hours apart, when we have crew, uh, we're building a new liquid hydrogen sphere that's going to be 1.4 million gallons. And we need both of those together to get those three attempts. Um, we're also building the emergency egress system, which um, if something would happen on launch day, that enables our flight crew to get out to safety quickly. Um, that's a system that we're currently designing. So 
um, you know, we've done everything we needed to do for Artemis 1, but we are in the, um, in the thick of uh, the new development projects for Artemis 2. And it's really trying to get, you know, to that end goal of getting that first woman and man um, on the moon in 2024. Awesome. Good. Regina, appreciate you and all the hard work that you and your teams are putting in. Um, we are excited to see this thing fly, and certainly I'm sure that'll oh, be a so, proud yeah. moment for you. Absolutely. All right, for everybody out there watching, uh, please be sure to tune into the rest of our episodes this week. We're touching on our rocket, the Space Launch System, the Kennedy Space Center at large, and what we've done to be, be ready, uh, the Orion Space Capsule, and then some of the work to be done on the moon as we, as we go there with a sustained presence with our eyes on Mars. Uh, thanks, Regina. Appreciate you. Thanks, Joshua. It's good to be here. All right, reminding everybody out there, even the sky isn't the limit.